So now I could use the the fuck word. Is that right? <laughs> which which, which There's word? Precedent. <laughs> There's precedent. That actually was one of Elizabeth's f famous favorite words. She, that was her ever that. Um, I tell a story to begin with. Um, a couple from Newfoundland came to the parish, and he, uh, the husband, had met her, but the wife had not. She went to an Anglican church women's meeting, and when she came home, she said, Peter said, did you meet the rector's wife? He, she said, no, there was a young woman there, and I don't think she could be the rector's wife, because she was sitting there, and, and somebody said something, and, and, and this person said, fuck. <laughs> That's Elizabeth, said Peter. <laughs> anyway, this, this, this is really all about Elizabeth, and in a sense it's, it's a tribute to her, but I do come to assisted dying towards the end, but I want you to know that religious faith is a personal journey, and, and Vicky actually gave an example of uh, a very a trying personal journey that she took, a religious journey. And my religious journey, at least the end of it, um, the end of, the beginning of the end began with Elizabeth. That's where the beginning of the end was for me. And so I want to talk about Elizabeth first, how I came to know her, and how in the end uh, my faith uh, evaporated. And I think in order to understand what I say at the end about a sister dying, you really do need to hear something about Elizabeth and, and, and her effect on my life. But I also want to, to tell you this because in her journal she expressed the wish that at some point I would become published and I would actually talk about our love, which was very, very important to her. And so that's what I'm going to begin by, by doing today. This is a picture that was taken on May the 26th, 1988, and it's roughly the beginning of my relationship with Elizabeth. And, and the next picture is one taken on the 25th of May, which is almost at the end of that relationship. In fact, that, that picture was taken two weeks before Elizabeth died. The meaning and the purpose of life for me did not really come from religion. It all began, in a sense, with Elizabeth. And I think that's important. It's not hyperbole, it's an actual fact. Elizabeth felt the same way to a large degree. When we came together, suddenly for both of us, uh, life began to make sense, though suffering would later test the limits of the sense that love made of our lives. My life had always been saturated by religion from early childhood. My father was a United Church minister, and as you'll see, he was a missionary in India as well, and that's where I grew up. But religion contributed, in spite of this, religion contributed very little to the meaning and purpose of my life and gave little direction to it. Indeed, for the most part, it gave no direction at all. Of course, you might think that I lived in an enchanted world. I, did, I was born into a world at war, but I was too young at that time to know what war was all about. And by the time that I did know something about it, I was taken by my mother and father to India, where they were were uh, were missionaries, and India itself is, in in many ways, a uh, wonderfully beautiful place. But growing up there, in a sense, compounded the difficulty for me of finding meaning in life, for all its beauty and wonder. History in India was palpable. Everywhere you looked, there were wonders like these. That's the great stupa of Sanchi, it was not far from where my father worked. Uh, it's a Buddha reliquary. It was, it was, um, it was built in the third century before the common era by the command of the emperor, um, Ashoka. And then, of course, as that, these pictures were taken by my father, the Taj Mahal, or as it is in, in Hindi, uh, the crown of palaces in, in Agra. However, none of these, none of these cultural riches were mine. They didn't belong to me. They weren't a part of my world. Much as I came to love India, 
I could not make a home there, for leaving India and going home was part of the structure of the uh, missionary life. So I was a temporary visitor in the country from another world, and all of my school years, except one year that I spent in Hartford in Connecticut, was spent in a boarding school in Missouri, and that's part of the road leading to Missouri in the, uh, in the north of India. And I went to school at a place called Woodstock, and that's the school spread out along the ridge there in several different in, in several different uh, uh, places. That's the senior girls' residence. That's the younger boys' residence. That's the senior boys' residence. And the younger girls lived up at the school up here. And this is the way the school looks today, with several new buildings, as a matter of fact. My years at school were very unhappy ones, and even though the mountains became a passion and the distant snows were a lure hard to resist, you can see the snow-capped mountains in the background, I felt lost and very alone. This had a great do deal to do with my parents. My, my father was very stern and formal. Although, just to let me know who was boss, he once whipped me with his belt when I was about five years old for a minor infraction. And a cold stare was all he needed after that in order to, uh, uh, to make me do exactly what he wanted to. My mother, however, was a tyrant, and she beat me senseless and often. When I went away to school, I felt rejected, for abused children yearn for acceptance and experience separation as rejection, and I felt this with a bitterness and a sense of worthlessness and incompetence uh, that lasted until Elizabeth and I uh, were brought in love together. Of course, there were memorable exceptions, though joy was scarce. This, for example, is Kedarnath, a peak in the beguiling distant snows, which I visited when I was 15 or 16. The Kedarnath Glacier was famous and holy as being one of the sources of the Ganges River, held to be holy by Hindus, Hindus and it's a place of pilgrimage where pilgrims actually, pilgrims actually I can't find my muscle there. Pilgrims actually bathe in the icy waters that flow right out from underneath the glacier. And it's a particularly uh, uh, devotional thing to do. This photo is a picture of the temple at Kedarnath, which I took with my brownie Hawkeye's camera. And you can see the peak in the background. And the picture of the peak is actually etched on Elizabeth's and my It's etched on Elizabeth and my gravestone. Elizabeth had a business called Penny Pig Printing and uh, she was called Piglet by most of her customers. That's why the Piglet is sitting there. Given this background, though, it's not really surprising. I should show you this one, too. That picture of the uh, tombstone was taken on Halloween, and I always put a, a pumpkin down there because Halloween was... Elizabeth's absolutely favorite time of the year, when she could get dress up and, and play somebody else, and it also happened to be my birthday. <laughs> Given this background, as I said, uh, it's not surprising that my early adult life and my first marriage uh, should have gone so very wrong, as, in the, as indeed they did. 
It was Elizabeth who rescued me from this and made my life for the first time full of purpose. Elizabeth made all the difference. She was a, an astonishing woman, bright, witty, with a photographic memory that simply wowed everyone who knew her. She filled my life with the, the radiance and brightness uh, of, of love, and I owe my life to her. However, let's get us together first. She was only 15 when I first went to the parish where she lived, and we met only by chance. Her family, although Anglican, were not churchgoers. When her younger sister was preparing for confirmation, her mother insisted that, that Elizabeth went as well, and so our fateful meeting took place in this church. St. George's Church in Falmouth in Nova Scotia. On the way home from that first encounter, I, as I discovered much, much later, Elizabeth's cousin teased her, chanting in a children's rhyme that she had fallen in love with the minister. And this is my first picture of Elizabeth with the confirmation class. Elizabeth is on the stream, extreme left in that picture. My marriage, if that is what it was, was a disaster almost from the start, and by the summer of 1987, I had reached a point not far from despair. By that time, I already knew that I was attracted to Elizabeth, who was 19 at the time. Of course I was. She was gorgeous. However, I never thought of it as an attraction that had any mileage and that was going to go anywhere towards a, a uh, close relationship, because I was simply too old. Besides, though by that time, especially for the safety of the children, I thought that our marriage should be brought to an end, it's unlikely that I would have done anything about it. It's not easy for a priest to do this in, in public anyway, and, and I lacked all self-confidence and any sense of worth by that time. I was confused and uncertain about the future, and indeed I feared for it. I've often asked myself the question, when did I love her first? I don't know. However, I do know that I had become increasingly aware of Elizabeth over the years. She was simply always there. She came to all the special services, and she scarcely ever missed a Sunday. But more than that, almost always when I was driving somewhere in the parish, I would see her on a bike, almost every time. When I was at my desk in the rectory, which overlooked the road, Elizabeth would drive by on her bicycle. And when I was returning from a meeting, even at night, Elizabeth would be there on her bicycle, usually on the other side of the bridge, just below the rectory. This picture, as I recall, was the first picture that I took of Elizabeth, knowing that I was attracted to her. She was, she was 19 at the time. In one of my poems, I use those words. She weaved a film, filmy web of warm and undemanding friendship that grew into a world. And I speak of her as weaving a web because, as I learned later, she intentionally put herself in places where our paths would cross. <laughs> she believed, she believed that my marriage was falling apart and it was and as it was, and, and when it did, she wanted to be there to pick up the pieces. That's what she said. She even decided not to go to university on the strength of this, fearing that she might lose her chance. Later, she would say, I'm not saying that I'm that valuable, but she thought I was for some reason. Later, she would say, uh, uh, jokingly, that she had stalked me. Anyway, whatever it was, it worked. <laughs> oh, over the years, over the years, she became such a part of my life that when she was not there, I missed her. If she didn't come to church, I missed her. For a priest, it's all, always a little bit of a fillip when you have a young person come to the church, especially the Anglican church, which is not all that popular with young people, because it's fairly formal and liturgical and, and, and ritualistic. But around her 19th birthday, when this picture was taken, 
she began to put herself forward a little bit more actively, though even that for a young person is unremarkable, for a young person involved in the church. But about that time, for example, there was a youth conference on Prince Edward Island in which I was to take part, and it had been advertised in the parish, and Elizabeth wanted to go. And the parish was willing to pay her registration fee, and since I was going, she traveled with me. This is a picture of Elizabeth at the conference. Obviously cut out from a, a group picture of, of conferees. Later she would tell me that she thought of the sweatshirt that she's wearing as a gift from me, because I was in the University of Prince Edward Island bookstore when she bought it. So she had, and, and then she accompanied me to a day-long conference a few weeks later, and, and so there, a bond was beginning to form. Yet even that, it is, yet even with that, it's, it's only in retrospect that I can say that I was in any sense falling in love with this young woman. There were too many other wor worries, too many years between us, so it never occurred to me at the time that I, she was anything more than a friend. Though she was a beautiful girl and fun to be with. In retrospect, it seems that it was more than that, but only in retrospect. For at the time, I was really trying to save what was left of, of the marriage, despite feeling that it should come to an end. And we were just in the process at that time of buying a, a new house, which I had been assured would, would make all the difference. I convinced the parish to sell the rectory and provide a living allowance instead. Elizabeth actually helped with the move to the new house, and after that, increasingly, she became a frequent visitor. But it was the house itself that led to the crisis that brought the marriage tumbling down. After that, the problem was now how really to bring it to an end. This was in mid-October, 1987. It was after that... I'm sorry, I've misplaced, missed my place somewhere. Yes. It was after that, though, though slowly, that Elizabeth really began to come into focus for me. The difference in our ages was too great to be overcome in the first place, so my attraction, such as it was, seemed to have little place to go. At least that's what I thought. But by Christmas of that year, it began to seem to me that that is what it was, and my heart simply left, leapt whenever I saw her which was now more often. I took this next picture of Elizabeth around the Christmas season in 1987, and she was by that time almost a member of a family, and whenever she was there, there was peace within the household. Towards the end of January, this is very confessional, I know, but it's a part of, I think, of something that Elizabeth would want me to tell you. Around towards the end of January 1988, things began suddenly to click. It was another of those times when we were together alone. There was an announcement about a, a religious film to be shown in a cinema in a local town, and I was asked to advertise it in the parish, and Elizabeth expressed the wish to go, and could she go with us? Well, my wife didn't have any interest in going, and neither really did I, but... Anyway, Elizabeth and I ended up going together, and it was almost, well, it was almost like a date. Indeed, after the movie, I bought her a hot fudge sundae from the Dairy Queen, which seemed perfectly innocent up until the time that she asked me, would you like a taste? And then she fed me and herself alternately on the way home. And it seemed very clear to me at this point that the relationship was changing. And I had an occasion a day or so later to explore with Elizabeth how she saw the relation changing, whether she was just a friend or something more, because by then she was something more to me. But if she felt anything, uh, she gave no sign of it. She told me much later that she knew what I was wanted to know, but it was not her place, she thought, uh, to intrude. She believed that if my marriage were truly breaking down, I would come to her. She believed that implicitly. So the next move would have to be mine. And it was perhaps inevitable now, looking back, that I should have made that move and gone to her. Uh, though it was neither intended nor planned. I was driving her home from a visit at the new house. 
that's what happened. And as we stopped at a yield sign, and I had to look away back to the right in order to see whether there's oncoming traffic or not, and we just sort of enveloped in a kiss, uh, which was as ardent as it was unexpected. Oh, Eric, she said, passionately, and then she kissed, kissed me again. And then moments later, she was home, breathless with expectation. Actually, she locked herself in the bathroom for an hour or so because she was so overcome and she didn't want people to ask any uh, damaging questions. That kiss, however, changed everything. And there was no going back. I had allowed myself to think the impossible and suddenly it was real. I will not tell you of our courtship. It was certainly not a conventional one. It had to be carried out under the radar, so to speak, in the first place because married priests are not supposed to fall in love with younger women in their parishes. The ride was a bit bumpy for a while because my job was on the line for one thing, and a lifetime of moral habit too was, was being overturned, and I was still very insecure. Elizabeth, however, remained confident, confident uh, and constant. Looking back, it was also a joyous time. We did so many things together, and it's astonishing uh, looking at the pictures that I took at the time, how many different places we went and how much time we spent in each other's company. And here are a few of the uh, pictures that I took. That's Elizabeth skiing. We went for a skiing together. That's as Elizabeth was. That's at the new house. That's at Elizabeth at Grand Manan in August of 1988. Our first journey together. Um, actually, we got away with that because when we got back, her father had just been stopped for drunk driving, and so they didn't pay any attention to Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Elizabeth in the gas bay in 1989, uh, not that long before our wedding. That was Elizabeth on Bonaventure Island, where there's a, a, a wonderful Gannett colony that we visited. And that was us in the gas bay visiting a hard rock mine, <laughs> uh, all dressed up in uh, our mining equipment in 1989. Let's come to that picture in a second. There was, through all of this, something that I just could no longer deny. For suddenly I found myself in love for the very first time, truly head over heels, joyfully, and deeply in love. It began with that kiss. It's obviously to me now, uh, that I was more, probably more than half in love with Elizabeth a long time before that. And, and pictures that I treasure now show, I think, that I was being drawn slowly but ineluctably into the circle of her love. And that's Elizabeth, well, she couldn't be much more than 16 there, uh, skating on the pond beneath the church. And that was a picture taken at about the same time. And that's that's Elizabeth uh, with my daughter Kirsten. And they actually became mother and daughter over the period that Elizabeth cared for her. And that's a picture, perhaps a year or two later, of Elizabeth skating on the same pond with a hockey stick. And knowing that I was in love, I knew that I had never loved anyone before. That I simply couldn't deny. For if this was love, this was something entirely new. And our love was unique in some respects. It was a love that never diminished in intensity from that first kiss until the last about 15 minutes before she died. Elizabeth became a card-carrying pot smoker, as she called herself, uh, because of her MS, during the time that she had MS, and she kept a journal for her doctor, which I did not get to read until she had died. She called her journal The Cannabis Chronicles. <laughs> And you'll notice, that if you can read it, it's edited by Mary, Mary Wanna, and it's published by Holy Smoke Publishers, a division of If Pigs Could Fly. <laughs> On January 20th, 2003, almost exactly 15 years from that first kiss, she wrote, With each passing hour, my love for Eric increases. Sometimes I think my heart will break with the overflow of emotion. 
If there were ever two people who were made for each other, then it is us. We complement each other perfectly. And we both felt this, as I can confirm. It was an irrepressible feeling, just as she says, as though one's heart would burst with the surfeit of emotion. That honeymoon period of our love never came to an end, although people kept warning me that it would. I wish I would capture the sen that sense for you and, and express it, for, for there was a radiance about Elizabeth and that is hard to describe, a deep inner joy in the presence of which the world itself seemed to glow with borrowed radiance. Perhaps this, this picture taken with the ponies on Dartmoor, we went on our honeymoon to the, the United Kingdom and spent five weeks there, and this is a, one of the pictures that I took of her on Dartmoor with the ponies, and it'll give you a sense of the sheer brightness of her spirit. I went the wrong way. There. She really knew the secret heart of being joyful right up until the end of her life. Being with her was the richest experience I have ever known. I will not know it's like again. I tell you this because Elizabeth wanted me to speak of our love. As I said, that was life's meaning for her and for me too. After that first passionate kiss and seal of our love, my soon-to-become ex-wife moved out of the house three or four weeks later. I can't tell lies, so it had to end almost as soon as Elizabeth and I had exchanged vows of love. And from that day onward, Elizabeth cared for the children, looked after the house, cooked many of our meals, helped with the homework, managed our finances, and perhaps most importantly for me, took on the healing of a man 27 years older than herself, who had been deeply hurt by life. Rather amazingly, as we found out later, people in the parish assumed that we were living together. But we did not do so till we were married on the 29th of October, 1989, with the blessing of the church. She was a gorgeous bride, you have to admit. By then, Elizabeth had unraveled the knotted skeins of a lifetime's distress. Her love made all the difference. For the first time in my life, I spoke freely and openly, and she listened and she understood, and slowly and patiently, with a a wisdom far beyond her years, she began to put me back together again. An important stage in the process came in the fall of 1988. You've already seen the maple leaf up there, so I won't bring it back up again. Elizabeth was outside raking leaves and, and burning them, and she came into the house with a small red maple leaf, and she handed it to me. And this is very significant to me because I have always been a stranger here in Canada ever since I came because of my having been brought up in India, and she handed it to me, and with great weight and solemnity, she said, there, now you have a country. And it almost undid me on the spot. When Elizabeth agreed to marry me, uh, she told me that she was not really a believer, and had not been for some time. But she was happy to take part in the life of the church and to support me in my ministry, um, so long as I understood that for her, it was only a cultural thing. Religion had always been a very intimate part of the texture of my life. It was my only cultural identity, in a sense, and so I'm not sure that for me it was not also cultural. Sometimes I wished it could be more, but with Elizabeth, that no longer really mattered at all, and what had been a lackluster and a pointless life became one of happiness and bright purpose. This, however, makes what I do now day in and day out on my blog, very difficult, for it was, after all, the church that brought us together, and it was my life in the church that provided the t context uh, and the community in which our love could flourish and in which we could become one. Not one day passed in all the years since we first kissed, not one day, that we did not speak passionately of our love for each other. It was the one certainty that neither of us questioned. The community of the church was the context in which that love flourished. So my opposition to the church now, because I see it as having been a harm to Elizabeth, even when we least expect, understood this, is qualified by that relationship, and it makes what I do seem like a betrayal. But the church betrayed Elizabeth in my view, and I could no longer stand with it. I had begun quite early in my priesthood to talk about a sister dying, I did not see any reason, and do not see any reason now, 
why people should have to die in ways dictated by their diseases. And I was instantly taken with Dawkins' idea when I came to read it of having one's life taken out under anesthetic. The sanctity of life principle, quite frankly, never really made sense to me. As a priest, of course, I had accompanied many as they died. Uh, and there's almost a sacred feeling, too, when you accompany somebody uh, when they die. But many of the times when I saw people die, they were in great pain and distress. And in one case that I was mentioning to Ophelia yesterday, the suffering was so horrendous and unrelenting that the last hour was just one single uninterrupted scream. She had never stopped for one moment in that last hour until she died. These experiences intensified my own sense of the injustice of forcing people to suffer until they died naturally, as Christians so casually speak of dying in indescribably horrible ways. The Church's councils themselves always opposed me in this, though I little thought that it would affect me someday so deeply, so personally, and so indelibly. I gave the primate or the head of the Anglican Church of Canada a paper I had written in response through the Church's discussion paper on assisted dying, predictably entitled Care in Dying, but I re received no response to him, from him. I might have pressed harder, but by this time I did not think that change within the Church on this point was possible, but so much so for discussion papers. For the same pe paper still exists today. This one was released in 1998. The same discussion paper exists today as the only expression of the Anglican Church's position on assisted dying. And that is, to my mind, a scandal. Elizabeth knew as if by instinct, uh, almost from the moment that she knew she had MS, and she said even before she saw a neurologist that if her MS was as bad as Doug's, as it seemed by then that it might be, that she would not stay around. Doug was a man who had, was completely paralyzed by MS. He died a few years after Elizabeth's MS began, and I buried him. The fact that he tried to die by an overdose of uh, drugs was an object lesson for Elizabeth of what her future might bring. Doug was saved by his wife, but Elizabeth made sure that I understood that she was not to be rescued should she make the same choice. She saw Doug's life as a preview of what her own might be, and by the time Doug died, Elizabeth's life had already begun to go down the very same path. But she made it clear from the very start that she refused to be trapped by paralysis in her body. Almost with her first symptom, she was in great pain. MS opponents of assisted dying, who think that if one person with MS chooses to die, it means that everyone with MS ought to die, uh, say that the pain of MS can be controlled. This was not Elizabeth's experience, nor is it the experience of all who suffer from MS. What turned out to be Elizabeth's first obvious symptom of MS happened on the 6th of September, 1998. By November, when she saw her neurologist for the first time, she walked with great difficulty. Asking, asked by her neurologist to identify the level of her pain on a scale of 1 to 10 on a meeting with him early in 1999 to receive her official diagnosis, she said 11 or 12. I looked down at my legs, she explained, and I expect to see shattered bones sticking out through the skin. That's what it feels like. She was very stoical about it, but there was nothing that gave her much relief, though she tried practically everything. And as her range of motion diminished more and more, and her life became more circumscribed and limited, she dwelt more and more how she would, on how she would end her life and, and, uh, and when. Even so, she never lost her zest for life. Elizabeth in her wheelchair. She really never lost her zest for life. She was just as lively the day she died as the day we first exchanged our love. And she did nothing at all about this plan of, of taking her own life until the eighth anniversary of her first symptom when she tried on her own to take her life and it did not work. 
This picture was taken of her in August 2006, shortly before she made this attempt. It was, though I did not recognize it, and I should have recognized it, it was intended as her last gift, gift to me, a, a token of remembrance before she died. When I went into her, her, uh, her study, her room, uh, she was slumped over her desk in front of her computer, and she had a sign stuck on her back that told me to check for a heartbeat, and if she were dead, to call the funeral home. <coughs> but she was still breathing, about two or three seconds between each breath. So I moved her to the bed and lay with her for the next 36 hours or so until she woke up again, terribly confused and increasingly disappointed that it had not worked. But it did give us nine more months to enjoy our love together, and in the end her wish did come true, and she died peacefully, lying in my arms eight years, nine months, and two days since her first <coughs> symptom. Elizabeth did the counting. It was a great injustice that Elizabeth was forced to go to Switzerland and died before she otherwise might have done had a sister dying been legal here. And I do not forget that she had died once already to all intents and purposes. For these things I hold the churches responsible, and I don't intend to let them forget. Loving and being loved in return in the way that Elizabeth and I had our love made all the difference, as I've said. It was inevitable that my relationship with the church uh, should have changed as well, and it did very quickly. Eventually, as the years wound down to my retirement, I found it harder and harder to say what I did believe, if I believed anything at all. God seemed to be not only an irrelevance, but more and more an impediment. Elizabeth's memorial service, which was held in the parish but not in the church, was entirely non-religious, where God was mentioned only to be criticized, not to express belief. I spoke about my loss of faith and condemned the church for its stand on assisted dying. There was apparently great concern about the effect that my words might have had on, on all the faithful who had come together to say farewell to their much-beloved Elizabeth, but those expressing concern were told, oh, there's no need to worry, he didn't say anything today that we haven't heard before. And that was true. One friend, one friend had warned me that I was talking myself out of a job, which I very nearly did. Or perhaps I did, and people were just too polite to mention it. Now that you know a little bit more about Elizabeth and me, uh, I can go on to speak about the things that, that now concern me most. I would not be here at all, however, had it not been for Elizabeth, not only because I loved her and she died in extraordinary circumstances, but because she was herself so clear about her disbelief, because she was so determined to take her dying into her own hands, and because she wanted me to speak about our love and about the right to die. Religion simply was not a factor in this, and she was pleased when I told her that I was no longer able to believe, even not even in the attenuated way in which I had managed up to that point, uh, to speak of my state of mind as one of belief. Expressing my own non-belief meant that she no longer uh, needed to have a, a religious service just to please me, as she thought she had to do. So she uh, set about designing her own service so that people should know that she had not been a person of faith. And that was important for her to let people know. And she encouraged me when I returned from Switzerland to join in the campaign for the right to die. And so it's the one way in which the love that we knew can continue in other ways and perhaps influence other lives. So then, to business. Now, I don't purport to understand fully why it is that Christianity has made assisted dying and abortion the points at which, is it, at which it seems to be determined to make its final stand. And I hope it is its final stand. But I think it has to do with the dynamics of religious belief and its need for control over social order. Vicki Garrison said quite a lot about that kind of control in, in her speech. Um, I also think that if we defeat Christianity and, and other religions in this, they will have much less power and influence than they have now. Religion's determination to hold on to the entrances and the exits of life, 
has to do, I believe, with something absolutely central to religious belief and the source of the idea of the sanctity of human life. As I have experienced it in my own life, religion is deeply concerned with notions of order, cosmic order, social order, and the order and integration of the individual life in relation to others, and especially as religions teach in relation to God, the order in people principle as it is as supposed of the universe. At, at each of these levels, cosmic, social, and individual, at each of these levels, religions like to impress upon believers that the ordering principle that runs through all things is the power to which religion pays its dues in worship and obedience. In some simpler re religions, this aspect of, of religious belief uh, uh, and practice is more obvious and more dramatic as when sacrifices are made to the ruler of the universe in order to guarantee the preservation of that order in the regularity of the seasons and in the orderly procession of the sun across the sky. In such religions, the raison d'etre of these ceremonies was brutally clear, as in the Aztec offering of still beating human hearts to the sun with the apparent purpose of preserving the sun in its wonted diurnal course above a fruitful earth. In the case of the more sophisticated religions, especially the monotheistic religions, this concern for cosmic order may appear to be less central, but it is, I think, still their very heart and soul. And religious practice is, to a remarkable degree, devoted to the task of putting the individual and the community into a, a state of orderliness, which is thought to be, in some sense, an expression of cosmic order itself. Christianity has made much of the idea that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, and that our life task as human beings is more and more to make that image a closer and closer approximation insofar as our finite natures will allow to the divine nature. The purpose of pastoral theology in the Christian tradition was to find ways of ordering the individual life and so the life of the community to which those individuals belonged, so that they should be fully coordinate with the divine purposes for each individual and community, so that their lives should run with the grain of the universe, to use the title of Stanley Hauerwas's uh, Gifford Lectures. Besides the sanctification of time, uh, as in liturgical seasons and in the great feasts and fasts which, which so many religions uh, practice, there were also to be strenuous exercises of self-examination and self-mortification with a consequently increasingly strict control over the disorder of emotion and feeling which in early Christian thought is taken to be the unruly animal part of human nature which leads us into sin. And by the way, uh, in most religions, women have been thought to be most run by their emotions and that has a large uh, a large amount to do with the fact that women tend to be subordinated in, in religious cultures. O Augustine makes that very, very clear in his City of God. In the Greek Church, uh, this process of, uh, of ordering our lives uh, and making them run with the grain of the universe is called theosis, and they think that, that it's possible through, uh, through uh, 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 Christ's sacrifice to do this. And theosis basically means divinization, we become like God. For in aligning oneself with the rational structure and order of the universe, one is, it is supposed, um, reflecting the divine nature. Cosmic order is central to comprehensive types of religious belief systems, which is one reason why it is thought that religion and science must be consistent with each other. In Christianity, the story goes roughly like this. The world was created by God who loved it into being, and saw that it was good, that it fell away from that original goodness due to man's sin and so into consequent disorder and depravity is the very source of the religious task. If you read the story of the flood in Genesis, for example, it's obviously a process of uncreate, uncreation and increasing chaos and disorder. Redemption is the process by which, with God's help, we bring creation back to the original perfection of its order. And so, in a sense, as Christians learn to say, we become co-creators with God, so that in the end, God's purposes may be fulfilled in us. All Christian morality is, 
in this sense made up of individual and communal acts of restorative justice as we attempt to align our minds and our hearts and the whole texture of our lives with the perfect purposes of God. The whole of St. Augustine's magnum opus, The City of God, sets out to show in detail how the disorder of the present age is but the necessary preliminary of the coming City of God where God's purposes will be fully revealed. The important point is the disorder of the present age set over against the perfection and order of the revealed purposes of God. I, I don't want to dwell over much on this theme, but it is important, I think, that we understand why the churches and religion in general are so intrusive in society and in the lives of individuals. For each religion is rooted in some idea of cosmic order contrasted with the disorder of the individual and society, and in the supposed need to restore as much as they can of the original goodness of cosmic order as a demonstration of their faithfulness to the purposes of God. Religions cannot let go of their control. I think it's very important for us, let me just try to, uh, to explain one thing about this, because this, this, this comes out so clearly in, in so many of the things that are said about slippery slope arguments, and, and, and then I'll end on that point. In Proverbs 14.12 we read that there is a way which seems, seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. This sentiment, I think, is at the root of the religious prohibition of assisted dying. An example that I often cite is from Cardinal Cahal B. Daly's little book, Morals, Law, and Life. But the same belief underlies every slippery slope argument used by the religious to warn about the dangers of legalized assisted dying. Daly's argument significantly begins not with assisted dying, but with contraception, thus covering both the entrances and the exits. And here's what he says. The works of the scientific humanists are there to prove that man's attitude to contraception determines whether he will think it wrong or right for a mother to kill her defective child or for a doctor gently and humanely to extinguish his patient's life. For daily, anything that interferes with what is thought to be the God-ordained order of the human world contains the seeds of chaos which will eventually put everything uh, at, at risk and everyone at risk. So, in the end, let me just say very quickly, as I considered my concerns about assisted dying, and, and I don't usually use the word euthanasia or assisted suicide because they're very misleading. Uh, what we're talking about is assisted dying. It's, it's assisting somebody who is not necessarily terminally ill, but in, the, in a condition in which they believe that dying is the only way to bring an end to their suffering. So they, they ask for assistance to die in order that their suffering should come to an end. Anyways, these are some of the reasons, anyway, why I oppose uh, a religion, because I see it as having been all along something offensive and sometimes malignant, and this is something I was slow to see. It holds us hostage to unsubstantiated claims. And while I cannot regret the years that I spent in religion service because so bound up with the love that Elizabeth and I enjoyed and shared, I regret that nothing that I said in all those years would ever have been able to make of religion itself something kinder or more humane as I wished it to be. This will never happen. And that is why I have set my heart against it, though it played so prominent a role in my life and set its seal upon the one great love in which it was my privilege to share.